my mother and my father were refugees, and I haven't read from um, this collection in quite some time because it's not really relevant. relevant. Um, I tend to write about dogs and my mother in obscene ways, and, um, <laughs> and this is, you know, this was me being serious in my first thesis, so, oh, I should turn. Sorry. This is how I, I'm all the time. I'm just like a basket case when I'm reading. Okay. Usually I'm drunk, and now I can't get drunk, so. Um, <laughs> so now I ramble. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there we go. Um, a primary color, reach. Thanks, Tony. Okay. Um, so m again, my parents are refugees. I'm Vietnamese, and um, I'm only reading this because for some reason it seems timely. I will, not for some reason. We all know why it's timely. Okay. Um, a primary color reach. Oh, and it looks like this, so they're snippets. So think of them as, as little snapshots. My mother wears a paper hat, a boat flipped upside down, folded from newspaper. I want to say it looks good on her, but it doesn't. It's too big and it falls off, and I call this symbolism. I write a story with my mother and she's floating on a raft, a boat, she insists, but barely. I built her a story with a frame, one size too small and so shallow it strains to curve above the water. It's always threatening to capsize. There's a picture of my mother standing near Niagara Falls. It's a good picture. She's good looking. It's her honeymoon and she's in her late 30s. Her hair is curled and the photo is circa 1977. She's dressed in a beige polyester suit. A small scarf tied around her neck whips up, laps like a current to her chin. The force of the water falling flickers the hem of her pants. The scarf is probably polyester, too. I mention this fabric only because it's cheap, and despite that, it shimmers like water can. I find myself referring to water whenever I talk about her, bobbing in an expanse unending and eternal, a point where everything is blue and breaking. There is breaking near a boat. Water dribbles in, and people are vomiting crudely over the edge taking their time. The boat is old, skin peels, the mind loses to insomnia, the sweat of worry, anxiety, floating through an indecipherable direction. My mother's headache splits between the eyes and she cannot see the end to the circumference of blue water on blue sky and always the distance trembles together with the undulating heat of the horizon. Eternity is blue, an infinite breaking and swelling and I can see her arms waving from a pile of bodies heaped in fatigue. Water can wear anything down. Water breaks against the hull, splits apart and recedes. A woman's water breaks and her legs slit open and she feels like she's ripped all the way to the mouth where she's trying not to scream. Everyone's afraid they'll die if she says anything, but then a baby, gray and marbled, they toss the stillborn overboard, and from afar they can see the eyeless infant flapping through the clouds, its long arms waving. The umbilical curls from the belly and vanishes to the sun. I'm not on the boat. The boat disappeared 40 years before I was born. Bits of it are floating somewhere, tipping over with people. My mother, her brother, and 823,000 people fall out of it and I don't know what to do with them. Stroke. My mother wants me to learn to swim urgently. She never knew how. She's afraid I would become like her, afraid of water and surrounded by it. So I went to the YMCA and they pushed me in. I choke on chlorine, my throat burns, I hate them. I don't wanna go back the next day, but I do it. I do it until my mother sees me swim laps. I say the backstroke is fun, but even in the heated pool, the water is cold, submerged. Nothing sounds louder than your lungs or as lonely. At least I like my bathing suit. It's blue, it sparkles, it surrounds me. I imagine, I'm skipping. I imagine her apology to her mother and her father for never seeing them again. Imagine her hunched forward and holding on to the ridge of the boat as she does to a framed picture of her dead parents in our living room. And then there's like more, but you know why. Okay. Um, I'm going on to more fun stuff. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Thank you. Yay. Right. Okay. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm always awkward, okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, in memory of, uh, is the title, in memory of, the mind bends to the body in the slightest ways I think of you. I think of you in the oblique moments when I am tired and there's nothing but the day ending, the lights turned off and the soft sound of the heater humming an enduring string of reminders. The rest is lost, but the body is still warm, still continuous. And, um, and now we're going to my more funny ones. So I have a whole bunch of dog poems and then um, a dog mother poem, um, but I'm not gonna, okay. Joy, my dog licks his anus. Oh, I have two dogs, and I love them very much, but joy, my dog licks his anus. My dog licks his anus in profound delight, a fresh anus opening and closing as if mouth to mouth he connects himself, presses his head low to the light of a pale moon, the powerful warm wind, his tongue, a wild dancer. I just do that all the time because I like saying all those words together and how obscene they are. And I like how they sound Asian-y. And I, you know that's like not a good thing to say because, but I'm Asian and I can say it. So, um, you know. Okay, private parts. This is always um, a crowd favorite. Private parts. I tell my mother she smells. Her vagina, specifically. And could she crack the window? And we all know it's hot, right? So, and could she crack the window so that I could get some fresh air in the back seat? And also, could they turn up the radio? Because I love this song. Blink-182 is like so cool. <laughs> Naturally, my stepdad, the driver, turns quiet. He doesn't adjust the volume in our new 1999 Subaru wagon. His foot is a little hard with braking, and at the next light, there's a noticeable lurch. After a few seconds, my mother yanks at her seatbelt for slack, turns to face me in the back seat, and gets good look. You come from this stinky vagina. It was this vagina that gave you life. And I don't care if you smell something. You're made of the smell. You smell. She flips back, the seatbelt retracts with a snap, and I can tell by her neck that her face is red. And she looks over at my stepdad and asks if he can believe what just happened. I mean, really? Later, she declares loudly to the car ceiling that her vagina doesn't smell. But her comeback is so delayed, no one responds. <laughs> Only the song, What's My Age Again, is playing softly in the background. And at home, my mother asks, how could I be so rude? What is wrong with me? So on. I told her I was just being honest. Jeez. <laughs> I have a feeling that my own kids will be like that someday. Really, because I'm like pregnant now, and I'm afraid. Um, and that decades from now, I might overclean my vagina, afraid of my own odors, and instead hear my kids complain about my bad breath, or my hairy armpits, or my long toenails instead. And then I'll think of my mother, and everything will feel fitting. She'll be a smelly older woman by then, and every part of her will foul over her teeth, her hair, her anus, and the assortment of scents and ocean freely sailing through the air each morning, a new diaper, a new rank. I will smell all of her as she forgets the car, the seatbelt, the way she told me I was made from her. And when I'm done, she'll ask me to open the window and let her out into the world. And when I leave her bedside, I will smell my sweat, my hands, and I will recognize myself. Thank you. Hey. So it's like really good for my ego. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, let's see. So like being pregnant makes you not feel like doing anything but sleeping and eating tacos and burritos and like... Jamba Juice, and so I haven't been writing very much, so your clapping is really nice, so thank you, okay. Um, and this is my last one, bath time. Um, it's along the same lines, so no, no, no shock now, you guys are over the hump. Um, bath time, my dog smells, he needs a shower, and I take him to the bathtub, attach a special doggy hose, and spray him down. I go for his head, his ass, his penis, his ears. I add soap between his toes and everywhere between and to anything that folds, and I bathe him like he's my own. And without hesitation, I rinse out the center of his ass, 
lift his tail, and shoot the water in like a rosebud, like a bidet, you know? Anyway, I left the door open, and my um, roommate comes in, and he starts squealing and says, ew. He's chuckling and gagging at the same time. And then I'm thinking, I'm not sure what's more gross, my dog's asshole in full spread or me cleaning my dog's asshole. And either way, I remain silent. I want to say something like, everyone poops, or this is totally natural, dude, or you're next, because your asshole smells pre... No. But anyway, I keep silent. There's nothing to be said, really. My dog, my dog doesn't have hands. He has the intelligence of a four-year-old. He can't understand what I'm doing, or why I'm doing it, or why he should feel naked, or if it's even possible without clothes. But I've humiliated him, and he has no idea of that either. I'm manhandling him, and while by consent or not, he needs to be cleaned. He needs to be taken care of. He will be me one day, or how my mother will be soon. I will need to bathe her and touch everything and remain quiet. Thank you.